Welcome back, class. I'm going to talk now for a few minutes. We talked about in the first segment some concentration strategies. And so now we're going to spend a few minutes talking about diversification strategies when it comes to um, strategic planning. Um, typically, at least in this text, we're talking about companies. Normally, most people think about diversification. They talk about, or at least they think about financial markets. You know, what is your stock portfolio? You know, do you have enough diversification in your stock in your stock portfolio to offset financial risk if if any if the need arises, uh, especially in markets where the recession's looming or or high inflation like we have now that's looming. Diversification is always <clears throat> a great opportunity <clears throat> when it comes to your to your stock portfolio. Also, you think about diversification. Um, But when you're managing a team, if you're trying to build human capital and trying to expand human capital on your team, you may want to diversify uh, the work that your team members are doing. A lot of teams are, will be set up with, with and they, they focus on specialization. One trick ponies that this is all they do. They, they, they do <clears throat> part A or they do part B or they do part C. Whereas if you're diversified, you can, you can play around with, with, the, with the parts of your team. I mean, it's a payment integrity team, you know, director of, of <clears throat> payment integrity, Blue Cross Blue Shield for years. And one of the things that, that I stressed was <clears throat> diversification within that team because my team was made up of either analysts or clinicians. When I say analysts, mostly individuals that were analyzing healthcare um, goods and services, managing health care claims, making sure they paid correctly. And the clinicians were a group of nurses that were doing medical chart reviews for them. And by creating that diversification, so to some extent, I had specialization in which the clinicians were doing medical chart reviews, the analysts were doing analytical type work, but the diversification was that I found that I could take those nurses and train them so that they could, there's a lot of difference between reviewing a hospital medical record and a doctor's office medical record, but you could cross train the nurses so they could flip flop back and forth. Same thing with the analysts. When you're doing analytical type work, there's a lot of different analytical type pieces into a payment integrity to ensure those healthcare claims are processing correctly. But by diversifying that team, on both sides, both on the analyst side and on the, uh, the clinician side, it just maximized the human capital. But now we're going to move into diversification from a, uh, a company's perspective. And it's still similar type concepts, similar type theories. We're just doing it in a different environment. And when they talk about, at least the authors in the text, when they talk about diversification strategies, it says it involves a company entering an entirely new business, moving into a new value chain. Mergers and acquisitions is one way they do it, one way companies do it. Um, and we, again, we've talked about mergers, mergers, mergers and acquisitions in the past when we're talking about concentration type strategies. Um, and we've also talked about it, you know, horizontal integration and some, to some extent, vertical integration, or you can do it without involving an entirely other company. So multiple ways that you can diversify. And the authors go through the three tests for diversification. And with these academic textbooks, again, we, and I've mentioned it on more than one occasion, um, academics like to uh, take and let's say repackage concepts. So I think when you go through these three tests of diversification, like a lot of the other um, types of uh, repackaging of ideas that we've seen in the text in the past, it does, it, 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 a lot of it is common sense and a lot of it brings uh, concepts together that may have been fragmented and, and what academics will do is they will bring these concepts together, they'll repackage them and 
put them in an infrastructure or put them in some type of a structural process that actually makes may make more sense to them than it did when they were uh, a fragmented just group of ideas. So on the three tests of diversification, the first one is how attractive is the industry? Is there strong profit potential or is entry going to be risky? So now we're talking about profit potential, which I'm sure we'll all say, well, that makes a lot of sense. If you think you can make more profit, it makes it more attractive to diversify. Kind of the, the downside is, especially if the barriers to entry, either natural barriers to entry or artificial barriers to entry, if they're barriers to entry, it could make it somewhat risky to try to diversify and enter a new market. The second test for diversification um, is cost of entry. Can a company recoup the expenses associated with diversification? Uh, and they give you the example in the text, Philip Morris, you know, and seven up got together. Uh, Philip Morris paid four times the value of seven up and, you know, the merger acquisition didn't last too long. You know, Philip Morris ends up spending it all. But so you're talking about how attractive is the industry so go back to your go back to your profit equation. If the industry is attractive and you think you're going to make a profit, you're probably looking at thinking about at that point the revenue side of that profit function. You talk about the second test, you're talking about the cost of the entry. Now you're talking about the cost side of that function and taking one and two together. Revenue minus cost, it's going to give you an idea of what the potential profit is going to look like, both in the short run and potentially in the long run. And then thirdly, will the new unit and company be better off? And I think they actually make a very valid comment, um, and it's one where some companies kind of lose their way because they say, unless competitive advantage is gained, don't do it. So when you're looking at it, remember we talked about the first test, we're kind of thinking about profit and we're going to think about how revenue and cost are impacted. So that takes care of the first two. And then the third test is going to be, will the new unit and company be better off? Will it be advantageous for the company because it's going to increase their competitive advantage? Because if it doesn't help you increase that competitive advantage, then as the authors say, don't do it. And then when we're talking about diversification, uh, they throw out a concept here called related diversification. When a company moves into a new industry that has important similarities with the firm's existing industry or industries, um, they give the example of uh, Lulemon and Merrill got together. And it was a situation where the uh, similarities within the firm's existing industry or industries were similar. The similarities were there. Uh, Honda for years made, it really did a really good job uh, in small engines, uh, motorboats, lawnmowers, ATVs. Uh, they're very small, reliable, small engines. And then they get into motorcycles and they do it because of their ex expertise and experience with small industries. Again, similarities in the companies or in the, or in the types of industries. Also on to talk about related diversification is the core competency, a skill set that is difficult for competitors to imitate can be leveraged in the different businesses and contribute to the benefits enjoyed by consumers within each business. Think of Apple. Apple and innovation, Apple and creativity, iPhones, iPads, computers, related diversification, Disney and Pixar. Again, related diversification because of similarities. It contributes to the benefits enjoyed by customers within each business. 
sometimes related diversification fails to materialize. Um, they gave an example in the text, soft drinks and cigarettes. Products are not needed by consumers. They are not a, um, I guess it depends on which consumer you talk to, but soft drinks and cigarettes are definitely not needed. They're not, uh, they're not a staple in our society. If you talk to uh, individuals maybe in Europe or maybe in the Pacific Rim, they would disagree with you, especially when it comes to cigarettes, but they are not a staple in our society. So when you're talking about related diversification, it may not work well if the demand, if they're not, uh, if the products are not needed in a society and in thus it doesn't drive the demand for those products. Uh, and the second Second rationale is, and you see this sometimes, is advertising is going to be a driver because now you're trying to convince consumers that this product put on the market through related diversification are really needed. And when you're talking about convincing people, especially through advertising, that can get extremely expensive. And then they talked about for a few minutes about related unrelated diversification. When a company enters an industry that lacks any important similarities with the company's existing industry or industries. Uh, they gave an example and I hadn't thought about it, but Coca-Cola and uh, Columbia Pictures, um, Eddie Bauer and Ford. You know, think of all these Ford trucks. You said Eddie Bauer edition. Um, Eddie Bauer, that, 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 that was a brand name um, reliability, um, high demand, uh, clothing, camping, those type of um, items. And, you know, you co combine that Eddie Bauer brand with the Ford brand, and then it was it did it, it you know did a really good job for Ford in selling those Eddie Bauer editions. Picture knocks. Uh, you think about the little Swiss Army knives. Uh, uh, any of you? Watch those old MacGyver reruns. MacGyver had a Swiss Army knife. I mean, that dude could do, he could solve any issue with this Swiss Army knife. And so now you're seeing Victorinox, or not so now, they have in the past, they moved into luggage and watches, reliability, craftsmanship, long lasting. Victorinox is, is through unrelated diversification, moved into the luggage and watch industries and are doing very well. Uh, the one that you're the, the one that they gave in the um, in the text was uh, is one that's kind of still a question mark and you know kind of where they're going to go is Zippo lighters. As long as you know, at least in the United States, as long as the demand for cigarettes and cigars are there, Zippo did very well. And Zippo lighters are extremely reliable; they last forever. I mean, you see a lot of Zippo lighters in antique stores that. You know, still workable, and um, they've always been a uh, a product that has been reliable, considered a high quality product. But with the decreasing demand in cigarettes, what can Zippo do other than move into uh, countries that you know? It's again European countries, Pacific Rim countries, where they a lot of smokers still exist. If they don't move into those markets, how can they? work or what other type of unrelated diversification can they get into to help not only ensure that Zippo is profitable moving forward, but take and, and translate some of that reliability into other products. And I was going to um, kind of work, I was going to try to do this um, chapter in two segments, but I think I'm going to stop here uh, we talked about diversity. We talked about concentration. We talked about diversification. And when we come back in a few minutes, we're going to line this chapter up, and we're going to talk about uh, strategies for getting small. Talk to everybody in a few minutes. <laughs> 